This is Tyrannus Acre Forward, the ag industry's most thought-provoking podcast. Listen to interesting people as we go in-depth into the issues affecting crop advisors, growers, and farm communities. Uncovering the truth about the ag business and using technology to prepare for the unforeseeable. Ready to explore the future? Let's dig in. I'm here today with our guest, Sarah Beth Aubrey. Sarah, welcome to our show today. Would you mind telling our listeners just a little bit, who is Sarah Beth Aubrey and why are you here today? A good day, Mike. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm here because I want to be. I'm excited to have a conversation about agriculture, about what's happening, what's current in the world of our business. Uh, reaching those retailers and growers is what I do um, in a large measure in my consulting practice. So yeah, I'm excited for our conversation. So who is Sarah Beth Aubrey? Oh gosh. Well, I tell you what, I grew up on a grain and livestock farm, Mike, over in central Illinois. I've I have a University of Illinois um, bachelor's degree and a master's of communications from Purdue. So I'm ag through and through really and cut my teeth actually in the crop protection industry. I was a sales rep for a crop protection company, my first job, and knew I loved engaging with the growers. Didn't, you know, didn't find that 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 product sales were where I felt like I had my favorite moments. But what I loved was that conversation about the solutions. And so that took me into ag consulting, and I worked with a firm called Adiana that a lot of people in the ag world are, are familiar with. And from there, I launched my own practice in 2004. Now, as I joke with you during the prep, I, I haven't had a job since 20, you know, since 2004, so in nearly 20, 20 years. So it's been um, a lot of fun building a practice. And you know what they say, if you love what you do, you never really work. And so this practice is called Elevate Ag. And okay. we run several different programs under the Elevate Ag brand. We can get into some of those today in our chat, but we do some work with customer engagement strategy, building peer groups and things like that. We also are building out coalitions around key topics and issues to help bring productive dialogue around important subjects in our time. So we can get into more of those as we as we get into the conversation. No, absolutely. It sounds like you've got got quite a bit going on. So you know, I, I work for a large crop protection company in the crop protection chemistry space, as well as biotech seeds and seed treatments. It's an interesting business. I think about, so I'm, I'm 44. I've been around a little while and, and I've seen kind of where crop protection and chemistry had a lot of patented and special position and the products and the science are just amazing what you can do. And then the, how seed treatment evolved and then biotech and traits and yep. Yeah, Sometimes that's product selling and sometimes there's a solution element. Yeah. But in 2023, I mean, I think about since 2004, since you mentioned that date, how much this has just changed. When you look over the last 20 years and you think about those product sales and that industry you're in, what what are the biggest changes that you've noticed in this industry? I, I've also been in the industry about the same amount of years as, as you have, about, the, about that same many spring seasons. And it's... There's a lot of, of course, consolidation. We all recognize that. If you couldn't have been around even five years in the business without knowing that, right? So that's sort of a, that's a baseline. We all, we all know that. I think some of the big changes I'm seeing is how how rapidly new brands come into the market now. You know, I feel like when I started in crop protection, I could name every brand for every type of product or service almost that my customer was using for their equipment, for their seed, for their chem, for you know their. You know, smaller mechanical things. I mean, you knew all these brands. We didn't have the technology with the digital aspects, the data collection. Of course, those things are huge now. And those companies coming into to the market, coming to our customer's door, new ones all the time. And then if we layer on top of that, the climate and sustainability opportunities yes. and the companies coming to our growers' doorsteps with you know, whether they're selling something as a solution or offering them a program to be the provider of a solution potentially to a buyer. And that is probably what's happened um, most rapidly, I think. It's amazing how much has changed. So you, you use the phrase consolidation. So we, I know there are a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, honestly, these are like Zoom calls that people can just watch as we have conversations. But I really believe that at Tranus and with an acre forward mindset, 
you know, we focus on that relationship between the retail advisor and the grower. And when you said consolidation, I think for the last 20 years, I've seen, yep, what can digital do? There's a lot of question, but also a lot of interesting behaviors and concerns. Is retail going to exist? Are growers going to just consolidate? What does the value chain look like? What does the Walmart or the other value chain partners really want? And you see a lot of different ideas and concerns, fears, opportunities. But one thing I've noticed is it's we're probably the first company and the only podcast that's looking directly at a retail advisor in rural America saying, we see you, we understand the challenges of your job. We understand that this is an artificial dichotomy between the retailer, grower, and even the input suppliers because they're all the same people on the same little league teams, coaching, volunteer fire squads. So I think we've had a lot of large corporate remote uh, influence in this, well-intended, trying to do some of the right things with technology, but you can't ever get around the fact that these are people that live, work, love, depend on each other in a very small community that have outsized impact to the world, making food, making things that people need to survive. And, and I say that because I'm passionate about, I think, the things that you work on is in this changing landscape, the customer is changing. The value chain is changing. When you look at this with your experience, what are those changes and what are some of the things that like think about retailers are, are sitting here, we're in the middle of planting, they're spraying, they're applying, they're moving product, probably dealing with a lot of customer complaints because that's how this is in agriculture. So listening to this, thinking about our audience, you talk about the changing face of the customer. What do you mean by that? Oh gosh. Well, one thing I think that we in agriculture today, we run global businesses. Every small farm is a global business and it's we don't think of ourselves that way. We almost think that mantle is grandiose, perhaps, but it's not. Our the the fruits of our labor, the product that we put out from our farm goes somewhere globally, at least in part. And even if it doesn't directly as a raw material, if it's in, made into an ethanol or something like that, that product goes. So we run global businesses locally. It's it's a it's a crucial really element to think about. I, I encourage growers to kind of to kind of think about that to to recognize that um, it really puts a little bit of levity sometimes in what they do and and it, and I think it's important. Um, it also helps to explain that to their neighbors and and to you know really understand here's here's the you know the magnitude of, of what they're out there doing. But as we think about the changing with with retailers, you know you you commented that we oh well will retail be there and. Right. We've been How many that. times did we hear that? And we go back around the same time. How many times did we we hear this concern and it's a perennial concern? Yes. Will it go away? Sorry to cut you off, but to me, this is one where it keeps getting said, and I don't know why folks can't see. We have to move big, heavy things and have specialized advice. You can't just with a click of a button replace those activities, can you? No, you can't. And we've been saying retail will go away for my entire career, and it hasn't. It has changed. And what has changed is that there there are things that you can do with a with that retail advisor middle person if you want to call them that that the large companies no matter what they produce and I'm not taking anything away from them they're part of the thing that we just talked about but you, it's about coverage you physically cannot get enough people you know in a call center to handle what's needed to really do service service is physical it's it's often in person it's often face to face or even if even if it's just FaceTime to FaceTime, you just cannot get enough people to do that if it's so fully remote, so fully abstract and far away. Yeah. And so the the retail exists because that advising fact is always going to be necessary. There's always going to be service that is a need. And there's always going to be some level of coverage, like the amount of people that you need to get out there to do a job physically or to handle a question or like you talk this season, there's complaints or concerns or breakdowns or whatever they are. Yes. So I think as we, one way we recognize it has changed, we have more tools. It might be more difficult than it was 20 years ago when we started our careers, maybe, you know, because there's a lot more parts. There's a lot more things happening. Um, there's a lot more inputs that we're using. We're using a lot more tools. So it the complexity grows. But to me, that endorses my view that we really, that retail is here to stay. 
Now, the retailers that don't evolve, okay. that don't get modern, that don't embrace all of the necessary tools, become expert at those and provide a suite of services that the modern grower needs, they have a problem. But for those that do, I think their value just grows. So so think about that. I mean, because I think that's interesting. I don't think everyone will win, but I think the trusted advisor and those that lean in and, yeah. and want to create that economic value, want to create those partnerships, will continue to grow and have a space no matter how the value chain transforms. You have to have specialty roles. You have to have people who know what's going on. So you said something about a modern grower mm -hmm. and the changing faces. I, I have to ask, what is a modern grower? It's not skinny jeans, right? Because you still have to get on equipment and off equipment. So what is a modern grower? Oh, we could go talk. We could start talking fashion about, but I don't know sure. that we're going to go there today. Um, I don't know about that skinny jeans thing. I think a modern grower is one that is looking at that global holistic view about what they do. Okay. They're thinking always with an eye towards sustainability. And I'm not necessarily talking about environment, although I that is included in my comment, but they're also talking about legacy. Where is the business going for me as I want to grow into this business if I'm a younger person or for my family if I'm an older person thinking about transition. So, you know, you, modern growers have a long game. You know, we do things day by day, but our industry is such that if you, you know, it's really like one year might be poor, but if you look over 10 years, you really have accomplished a lot, right? Yeah. So the modern grower has a long game. They have a long view of what they're going to do, and but they take a series of actions step by step. I think that they really look at the new opportunities out there. You know, the, the mindset of the always doing it the same way is going to be, that's going to continue to be harder and harder to do um, it, because the opportunities, the changes, and frankly, whether it's consumer demand or things that we will be asked to do that today might get a premium, yep. let's talk about credits. Those are potential opportunities for premium today for many growers. But what if at some point they're the cost of doing business? It's, it's the societal cost that we have to pay in order to sell to a customer. So modern growers keeping their eye on that all the time. What is not only a carrot for me, but what is something that is a shift in my industry and with my buyer, maybe two or three streams down the chain that I'm going to have to be reacting to and I need to be ready for. So I think there's just a lot of factors in that, but it, you know, it's paying attention to the incredible things that are happening out there and, and taking steps to take advantage of those. I, I, think, I think that's exactly right. I think you have a much more interconnected global value chain. We have a lot more transparency. What we do, I mean, we have game tape for your acre. We're literally FaceTiming the crops. Maybe not literally, but it's pretty close to that. And if you want to be a trusted advisor or a crop whisperer or a professional, you have to have that game tape so you can continually improve. But also, I think about licensed operate. You do good work, you should show it off as a grower. But I, when you keep talking about the grower and I think about the grower, I want to go back to retailers and cooperatives and advisors. And so they have to change and they have to meet those needs. So I'll plug one. I was at uh, out in Iowa at some Landis events and they're a good partner of ours. And they've got uh, Matt Carstens as a CEO there and, and they're really innovative. I don't know if many people listen or look at what's going on there, but the things that they choose to get involved with, whether it's getting their growers the opportunity to create and own their own intellectual property through different programs, uh, mimicking some things that come from government technologies and programs to do that, or figuring out healthcare benefits for their farmers and trying to work with the state to enable things uh, to do the right, or helping people be able to plan and keep farming in their family, in their legacy. And, and what he kept saying is, it's not something the cooperatives have done. It's not even some of these things we shouldn't have to do, but if it's not us, who will do it? And so I see a spirit there, and, and we see that in some of our partners of, we're going to try to solve the issues that are coming and that our customers, our cooperative members, our growers are dealing with. When you think about retail advisors, either as a grower or as a consultant, advisor, educator, what are some things that you believe are important that retail has to start doing or thinking about differently to meet these challenges? There are a variety of things. And I think the first step is they just have to own that. They just, the first step is look at their market. What do we need to do to be different in this marketplace? 
Okay. One of the things that I've done a lot of work with, I told you about customer engagement strategy. And the simplest thing that we can do that's been the most impactful is niche down. Niche, and one way we've done that is with peer groups. We, I've built um, custom peer groups for a variety of clients over the years at the large company level, at the, at the individual farmer level. They, you know, I have one of those that, that's been together for 10 years. And then oh, even wow. at the retail level where they created the, a custom group for themselves and they use them as an advisory board. Uh, one of the ones I created, they built a system of sharing their resources. So some of these growers have a lot more employees in the winter that they don't need, but they got to keep them on because they don't want to lose that really great employee when they've got to ramp them back up. So sharing those over to the to that partner retailer that says, well, in the winter, we could use some people in the shop that you may not need because you're, you're, you don't have livestock or anything like that. And you're kind of done and you've shut the doors. So sharing employees. Um, one of the peer groups we created, we came up with a model where they're sharing equipment. Um, okay. With the retailer has the sprayer and the farmers partnering and they've got some hours exchange. That is something that they don't typically do, right? So the idea is meet your best customers and find unique solutions for them and then scale those beyond that where where you find that works. So those kinds of customer engagement strategies really give a retailer a way to do a beta with their, you know, with customers that also are innovative and understand it may not be perfect, but we've got a couple unique problems here that we could potentially solve if we actually just sit down on a regular basis and have that dialogue. And so that adds value in a way that no product, no service, no brand c- can really do. It's it's completely different and it solves an equation that's not necessarily about selling seed or chem or fuel because uh, yeah. the farmer needs these other things too. They've got a labor problem. They've got equipment that's sitting. They've got trucks that are sitting, whatever it is. So partnering in different ways is one of the things that that we've done with some of the work and, you know, I, I don't handle logistics or anything like that. I'm not out dispatching the, the trucks and helping them in that way. But what we're doing is just facilitating a conversation to go, let's get the right people at the table and let's create a regular forum for uncovering how we can work together. And then that takes, like I said, that takes that value that they bring so up so exponentially compared to the company down the road that they could go to for similar services and products. That's that's really interesting because I think the logistics are the backbone and they're important. Yeah. But what growers need because a grower is not in the field all day, and some of them aren't agronomy experts. Some have different skill sets, different passions, different businesses. So the advisor, I think we agree, and I think most people know that the advisor role is here to stay. But yeah. to be successful, you have to marry the logistics with the key pain points that your customers have, and try to. They're really. Is a trusted advisor really an integrator to bring these solutions together for a grower? Is that is that what we're talking about here? Or is that what they're supposed to be? I think it has to be because if you think about the word advisor, you know, let's say you have a word, let's say you set up, you know, you see, you read this all the time in farm magazines, create your own board of advisors, get okay. your bank account, get your, your seed, you know, agronomist, um, get them together. And, and I think that's really great. And I've helped some firms do that. And I'm, I'm not I'm making a joke about it, but it's something we hear about. Yes. So if you really look at the word term advisor, they don't have a, they're not necessarily in business with you, although they could be, they don't necessarily make a financial decision or have a fiduciary responsibility like a board of directors does, Right. but that advisor should have bring value. They should help you do something or provide input or ideas or experience or a connection that you didn't get somewhere else. And so if you really drill down to the word, if you want to be a trusted advisor, you've you've got to earn that and you've got to figure out how you're doing those three things in a way that your competitor's not. So I think where we try to help as a company, as Tyrannus and with our Acre Forward concept and product line is we believe that just like what we want to do with our customers, we want to serve. And if you're going to serve, you have to have care or love someone. And to do that, you have to know them. And so we try to bring... Uh, a lot more knowledge. I know we don't hear we don't hear that a lot in our mm-hmm. business, but it's the concept of the more you know someone, just like when you meet your spouse for the first time, you get to know them. The more you know them, the more you have care, the more you love, the more you love, the more you're able to serve and the more you want to serve. I think about retail organizations this way because you have a lot of people that you need to motivate, that you need to bring together 
And so one of the best ways to do that is how can I know this grower better? How can I know the, the challenges, the problems? I usually think that in terms of what's on the farm because of what we do. And then once I do that and my team is doing that, then there's more concern and more passion and more drive and then better service. So just talking with you a little bit, you know, beyond the technology that we're providing, which obviously I believe in, what are the best ways when you look at retailers and advisors, what are, what are some things that they should be doing to create that kind of knowledge and culture and mindset to serve? And where do you see the mistakes or the lack of willingness to do so or, or reasons or objections or things that hold them back? In short, what should a retailer be doing that you think you've seen is successful to create teams, to create a positive grower experience? And why do you think this is hard to do sometimes? And what are the top mistakes that you see? That's a lot. I know, Sarah. A lot of questions there, but they're all they're all related. So yep. Let me let me think about this. So one, obviously, we talked about niching down, right? And yes. You gave the example of some of the work that we've done in my practice to bring these, you know, create these unique customer engagement experiences and really bring the customer there as as an advisor. And I think okay. one of the things that I would say works is is things like that. But it, the, at the center of it, it's really about having conversations that not is not always about product. What are those other touches that are not about sales? You know, and we we've all had sales training. I've taught sales training. I've written sales training curriculums over the years. I think sales training is fun. A lot of people don't, but we know that you you have to create something. You know, you have to get to know the customer, like you said. However. There have to be other ways to reach out to them and have that customer want to hear from you that isn't just, uh, it's time for prepay. Like, let's, what are, what are we doing? You know, let me come out. That's fine, but that is a base minimum. Everybody does that. You're not special, unique, or valuable, right? If you just right. do that, it's not, it's not kind of cutting it. And so to how do you get your team to do that? Um, I was doing some sales training with a, a young team and we had we had the proverbial young team, old team brought together as a new team. And that was a lot of fun, mostly for me and not for them. But you know, because they were disagreeing about, but part of it was there was no continuity and we're not trying to turn people into robots and be all the same. That's very boring. But there was half the team was, you know, let's just use examples, you know, having a cigarette at the table in the middle of the meeting and wearing a pulled neck t-shirt that hadn't looked like it hadn't been washed in, you know, two weeks. And then the other guys were, well, I've got, my truck looks perfect. It's super clean. You know, I've Almost got- Almost too clean. That's so perfect. Yeah. That, you know, the farmer makes fun of me when I pull in, like, do I look like I work at all? Um, and they're, you know, spit shined. So, and they didn't get along, as you can imagine, right? They thought they each made fun of each other. Workhorse yeah. versus show pony, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And so we, but it, it wasn't necessarily true in a, from a practical standpoint. Okay. The problem was there was no cohesion in the team. So it looked bad out in the country, right? Because some of the guys with, you know, were saying, well, these young kids, they don't know anything. And the young guys were like, well, call, you know, work with me. The old guys are stale. That's a terrible mistake. And it's one that we see a lot. So the big thing I think that you can do is it's, it's, it's not, it's easy in theory and difficult in reality is, are you a cohesive team that works together? And I know there's commission and stuff like that. I get that. But if, you know, if you make one call, does that really mean that, you know, someone else will help out if they need to and right. back up? And so those are basic things, but I see them still being mistakes over and over and in today's market where, again, there's a lot of choices, a lot of trucks pulling in and out of drives. So how do you create consistency within your own group? And generational differences are a real deal, right? If, you're, yes. if your team hasn't gone through at least some kind of um, understanding and relating to diff different generations training, I think you should. And it, it's it's fun to do. It sometimes can can take the air out of the bag a little bit on some of those disagreements that we have about work styles. But just some of that stuff we, we take for granted, we don't want to do, we're busy in season, but it really helps when the rubber meets the road, how you, know, how you look and how you appear, um, and also for that morale in that group. I think for a lot of businesses, some of those things are easier because the jobs are easier. 
But if you're an ag retailer and you're listening to this or you're running a co-op, there's so much um, that's variable. There's so much that can go wrong that you really have to trust. And, and they do. There's great people doing this. You said trucks. Where, how do you even know where your truck should be going? And then if they're going, what does that experience look like? And how are you leading and motivating a team so they understand those growers' needs and so they can make sure that your solution is the preferred solution, that your solution is the right for you and them? Because churn's also a big issue, losing yeah. business. I, I was shocked when I got into seeds years ago, and maybe it doesn't shock people, but it surprised me that a good seed business had a churn rate of 20% a year. That means one out of five you're losing and you have to replace, and then you still need to grow. So it, it I find that really, and look, the average grower is buying from three input providers, and this is just input. So what we're not talking about and what's still interesting to me is the equipment channel is a very different channel. The irrigation channel, these are all very separate yeah. channels that a grower has to contend with. So I find this really just interesting is how, why is, why is it still so fragmented? But if you're an input retailer, an ag retailer, what should you be doing and how do you motivate your team and know where they're going and, and work better in this environment? How's this going to change? I know I'm asking a lot of deep questions, but for me, it's oh, they, coming from the outside. Sometimes you look back and you come into these different markets and you see how this works. You all have all these entities have the same customer. Yes, that, the growers getting hit from many different angles, and there's no. You said continuity. I really think that's an issue. Is we're all trying to help the grower do profitable, make profitable yield that endures generation after generation, but everybody's got a different. Um, different angle into this and I'm not sure it's well coordinated today. So you, you have experience with this. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I think two separate things. One on the well coordinated with all the things they supply over here. But I want to drop back on your first one and just um and add one other thing that I think fields into this about the consistency. You know, we think we in the retail sector there we are so busy. There is a tremendous volume of literal work to be done in the seasons, yes. right? It's yeah. It's exhausting. It feels very thankless at times, blah, blah, blah. That's it, it's very true. It's legitimately how it is. And and getting people to want to work in that environment and then decide if they want to thrive in that environment and then decide if they want to have a career in that environment is it's an impressive um, feat, to be honest. But one of the things that I've learned over my career is about preparing people to go to the next level. And this is a mistake that I see retailers make, but the good ones excel at it. And I have a, a colleague who I was discussing this with in, in the ag retailer sector. So maybe he'll listen to this and think it because it's his story. I won't give his name. But yeah, he's talking about when he first took over the leadership of an organization and it was going through the steps of how do we make things better? What's Where's things breaking down? And what he realized was people were getting promoted without any sense at all of what the new job was. And so then the service all of a sudden went down, even though a great person was supposed to be in the role. And and to put this into context, he said, you know, man, I, I've been a great sprayer operator. So I, they made me branch manager. What did I do to deserve this? You know, because now was he right? Was he prepared to go from that role to a, a management role where no, right? Even though he was great at one job, it was almost like punishment to get promoted and people didn't want to be promoted in their culture from the field because they're like, no way, man, I don't want to run the branch. That's a way to get everybody mad at you. Well, why was that? It was because there was really, it was just an assumed into the new job and there wasn't really a path for growth to say, you know, you seem like you've got some desire to get into management. Let's get a path for the next, I'm just going to be arbitrary, 24 months to build the skills, to give you leadership, you're going to, you know, and then by the time you get that opportunity to be promoted, there's a more seamless experience that the customer won't suffer because suddenly you were really good at this and their next call with you is a job you have no idea how to do and you really wish you hadn't even taken. it. And so I think promoting from within is great. And we do have, it is difficult to get people to want to stay in these roles. So you're thinking, Anywhere I can get a good person to take the job, I'm going to hire them because we're really, it's really kind of almost desperate at times. But if we, in the off seasons, one way retailers stand out is if they plan for those things. 
Yeah. And a lot of times they forget because they think about planning for the sale for the next crop here, the equipment, fixing stuff, buying some new assets, whatever it needs to be. But really getting these people in the right spots and making sure they're ready is one of the consistency challenges to go back to your question. You know, and then to your point about how do we, so the grower has a ton of touch points with all of these providers. Yes. So you're about that. You know, they've got obviously all of the equipment. Now we have all these companies coming in wanting to offer them a program for for carbon or something like yep. that. Dealing yep. with how on earth do do we provide advice? Because we started a group that I run now called In Climate here in Indiana. And one of the reasons we started this group is it's for agribusiness and energy professionals, is that we can be better advisors to our customer. Because if you're trusted, isn't this interesting? They come and ask you questions that have nothing to do with what you sell them. Right. So we were starting to hear from folks at the retail level like, hey, we're, you know, our customers wanting to know if they ought to sign this program, but I don't really know. So how do I bring myself up to speed? And I think that's another um, really important aspect of being a trusted advisor is you've got to keep learning what's what's current and modern where your grower is going to get um, hit next. And yes, you can be ready to talk to them in, you know, maybe you shouldn't be given marital advice, but you probably ought to know about the what carbon credit programs are that are out there. Maybe you offer one, maybe you don't. But if you're a trusted advisor, you need to be able to speak to them. Yeah, I think one thing we look at our technologies and and the Acre Forward Intelligence Set is we know all the stand counts, which is more important when you really think about knowing the start of crop got across millions of acres, different fields as an advisor, even grower, changes how you optimize your inputs and what you do in the season beyond a replant discussion. And it helps you understand like your weed species coverage, defoliation, nutrient defi- all these threats that are on the field. And what do you have to have? You have to have inputs and application and, and ways to manage those threats. And now we can vary in a field and from field to field what we're doing. And when you have that kind of visibility, first of all, advisors do great work. They should show it off. Growers do great work. They should show it off in value chain. But it begs the question, a lot of people talk about sustainability and regenerative ag or carbon. There's lots of opinions and spectrum on this. There's lots of hype, to be honest. We're in this space. Uh, we do acre four sustainability. What we're doing is we have a within our acre four crop intelligence system, all the, the normal things that I just shared with you are key indicators of what do I need to do better? How can I improve? How am I working? Uh, with my growers, how's my grower being able to have more profitable yield. But as part of that, we can see and we understand with the retailer, through and with the retailer, maybe the regenerative practices that can be better for that grower or for the choice, right? So we're not saying you have to do tillage this way, you have to do a cover crop. What we're saying is we have models that show you that if you make these changes, if you choose to, this could help your soil health in this way or that way. And then it makes you eligible or you could be eligible for various carbon programs, right? And we're inviting program developers and partners to position those programs. But just so I share with you, what we're trying to do is we know that the retailers and the growers are doing great work. We understand certain things about those farms and we're inviting them together to avail themselves of these opportunities to improve their soil health and or avail themselves of these carbon credit opportunities. So Maybe let's talk a little bit about that because I hear a lot about it. I used to hear a lot more about it than we're hearing lately. But where do you see carbon credits really getting monetized and taking off? And what do you think the barriers are uh, for making that happen? Because I don't see it as ubiquitous these days. If I go run into 10 growers on my way home and have a conversation, I'm generally not running into somebody who's participating. So what are you seeing? Like, What are the leading programs? What's working and you know what's not working? Well, what's not working is long time horizons for okay. a, you know you hear that from growers all the time. You know if a company comes in and, and they lead with low dollars and you commit to me for a long time, most of that stuff has been weeded out to my knowledge. And I'm not going to get program specific, but sure. you know, several years ago when we first started hearing carbon programs coming out, that was a prevailing offer, right? You're going to get, you know, arbitrarily 10 bucks and you're going to sign up for 10 years and it's going to be 10 years before you get your first 10 bucks. Well, 
shock. No one really got into that. <laughs> you know, they, right, right. It wasn't really that well, that kind of stuff wasn't that well received, right? And I don't think it's because growers didn't trust that they could make the improvements. It's just, it's too new. I don't know you. You're not trusted, right? So yeah. Why would you be a company that comes in and leads with a low price, long time horizon, and I don't know you? Like, like yeah, are you going to be here in 10 years? Right. Right. Like, are you going to be here in 10 years? Who are you? You didn't come from my trusted advisors that I know. So to me, that seemed like a person who didn't know ag that came up with that. But that's just that's just me talking. What do I know? So that seems like a way to walk into a room and not have a clue who your customer is or your audience or understand how they think. And I mean, ag is still a relationship business. Another reason why, even though technology and and, and efficient things and cheaper prices that you can get from a just buying it online, that's good. And some people will always do that. But there's still a piece about that relationship that's important. So if you come in with a bad offer and you don't look trustworthy and I don't know you, why would I ever adopt that? Right. Really, I've seen carbon credit programs now moving to leading more with the soil health aspect, which makes a ton of sense, right? If if I want to do some practices that improve my soil health for the variety of reasons it does, you know, we can talk about the yeah, I mean, pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere. We can talk about lowering emissions because we do that. We can talk about it makes us more money. It makes our our land healthier. All those things are great. That makes a lot more sense. If I'm a farmer, I'm like, Okay, if I want to make these changes, now I see why those those might matter to me. Right. Then if there's money to be made, now let's talk about that. And so what are some of the barriers to entry? Well, the one of the big ones is labor. I mean, if I don't currently do some of the practices that even if they might improve my soil health and I like that, I have a labor issue potentially. Okay. You know, large farms are operated at the management level by only a couple of people, right? And the rest are what? Typically seasonal. So you may lack leadership or consistency for implementation. Labor is a challenge. So to me, adding extra steps, even if I think they will be beneficial, that is a pretty big decision making point. And I think that trying to figure out how maybe it's technology, maybe it's, it's equipment tools. I don't know. I'm not an expert in those things at all. Maybe those things, as they grow and become more widely available, will improve adoption of programs. If it makes yeah. it easy for me to adopt this with the resources I have, okay, I maybe I would like to do that now. And then with regard to just carbon markets in general, I mean, if you look at Europe, they things are different. They there we were around that, I don't know, fifteen to twenty dollars here. And I might even be on the high side if we're talking per ton. But in Europe, you know, they're more than double that. Um, do we need to get to those numbers before more people will adopt those programs here? Potentially, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's a big consideration. And then, at what point do these are these programs just going to continue to grow and 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 make you're going to have more and more dollars that you can collect every year, or does the market become saturated and there's not enough customers, right. or the customer has to you got to think about what is the carbon credit really for? The customer wants it to offset the stuff that they're doing. It's a syntax for that customer, right? They don't have to change if they purchase your offset, right? You made a change for them. Right. That, and again, if that change benefits you, that's great, right? You, the practice is good. It's good for your soil. We like all this. But you made a change, so someone else doesn't have to, or at least not entirely, so at what point is the offset enough for that buyer or did when or do they have to start doing more in their supply chain? You know, they have to so that's the concern I have is I don't know and, and I I like the carbon credit market. I work a lot with the those companies and I think they're some of them are doing some really good things. But most of the things they're doing that are really good is around adding value to a practice that's already gonna benefit the grower. And right. that's where I see the real heart of the matter coming in. Also, a lot of it requires a change. So growers that are already doing things yes. may not get a benefit. It's those that have not made changes that are perceived to be beneficial towards the goals of these carbon programs, correct? It is. And that, of course, is a major sticking point with a lot of folks who have had a, a strong heart for the conservation, till, and regenerative agriculture practices in prior to now. And that sticks them off. And and rightfully so. Now, I don't know how that will change and emerge over time. I think it will. But right. 
you know, and I think too, we have to think about younger and younger farmers. You know, we now have Gen Z farmers in the field, whether they're just helping, but a lot of those, you know, the oldest- We got past the skinny jeans now, because I see, I have teenage daughters. I see now there are different fashions that, (laughs) that, that don't even make sense to me anymore, but sorry to interrupt it. When you brought up Europe, I thought about the skinny jeans as well. So I think we're just on that topic. But so with younger farmers, what what do you see with Gen Z and, and younger? There, you know, every generation has its its differences. And I firmly believe that I think and I think you have to accept that and, and have and have fun with it and, and learn to work within because a generation is about their life experience, right? It's it's the experiences that you had that molded you into the person you are. And you can't change that for somebody else. And you sure as heck can't change it for somebody who had 50 years different or removed from the experiences you had. So if you right. think about Gen Z farm, the oldest Gen Z kids are now old enough to drink, right? They're they're 21 or more and they're coming back to the operations. He doesn't, we don't think of that, but they're emerging as leaders very quickly. The generations Gen Z and younger have a philosophy about things. And this is not just an ag, but across the board that tends to be, you know, they've they largely lived in, at least in the U.S., in a world of abundance. So they could think a lot about more philosophical issues and why they matter to them versus those of us who grew up with parents or grandparents that survived the depression were told more, it's just about survival. We got to scrap to get by. Don't, you know, who cares what somebody thinks? Just get it done, right? We got to make money. We got to eat. So if you think about the incredible difference in the perspective so I think the regenerative agriculture things from a philosophical standpoint will matter and are showing that they matter more for younger generations. So these young farmers that come in, they're going to want to be involved in these programs and they're going to help take the steps um, to implement them. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I don't think about the generational stuff as much. I do think, uh, and, I, and you're you're likely right about those things. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Gen Z uh, where these boundaries go with generations these days. I think I think I'm Gen X, so that puts me in a, a very small category population wise relative to the ones before and after me. What I do think about is technology and how quick it's changed. It's changing that conversation for everyone. So we know more, we see more, we understand it differently. And that's good, but it's also bad because it's easier. So sometimes we don't know why. And so I think we have a, a real change of where the tech is going to enable better decisions, but we have to slow down and really think about why did I get that response on my farm or why is this better for program X, Y, Z? What does it mean for me? So I think it all comes back to technology. Great. And these programs are, could, could be really great, but you still need a trusted advisor to be knowledgeable and have access to the right information and have the right relationship with you as a grower so you can maximize yeah. your opportunity now and for future generations. Yeah, you sure do. And, you know, to kind of summarize around this conversation about carbon yeah. credits and s- sustainability, I honestly, I was at an event this winter and I'll go ahead and call out the, the name of the organization because I think they're doing an incredibly good job in this space and that's True Terra. And I I heard some comments there that, that I hadn't, I honestly hadn't thought about before, but they've been with me the rest of the spring and winter. And one of the leaders there was talking about, listen, the sustainable agriculture that is, it's not going, that word's going to go away. Remember when we used to use the word e-commerce? I guess so. Yeah. Right? We, we said e-commerce, like it was some unique, different thing than going to the store, which it was, right? When right. We first started buying stuff on Amazon, it was e-commerce and it was all this. We don't really think of it. I mean, I suppose you might hear that word a little bit now, but it's not much. You yeah. really, you buy online or you buy at the store. It's like, it's either or. And you don't think anything of it anymore because it's part of the fabric of your life. You you purchase in one of those two ways and that's just, those are your options. And so one of their leaders was really sharing, that's kind of how this sustainable agriculture, climate smart agriculture, those terms in front of that will be kind of like e-commerce. They'll, they'll, we'll lob those off and that will be agriculture. That is how things will be done. These types of practices where we can do things that are great for soil health and we can be regenerative while using the technologies, the services, the crop protection, all those things that we have will be how we farm. And I, I found that to really be true after I spent some time thinking about it. I think it takes a while to seat into things that are new. Yep. But 
you know, conservation agriculture and sustainable agriculture, in many ways, we have been doing for generations. Just the practices, the technology, and the opportunities are continuing to evolve. I agree. I think in my experience, the best stewards of the environment and land are are the agricultural farmers and growers in the communities. It doesn't mean there aren't mistakes. It doesn't mean there aren't, you know, bad cases that happen here and there, but that's true everywhere. What I what I hear and what I appreciate of this conversation is we are in a globally interconnected world. And those of us involved in this industry, no matter what the viewpoint is, there's a lot more scrutiny, awareness, interest. Uh, from a larger number of people to a smaller subset that are working in this environment. So we need to put ourselves, just like in my crop protection past, like in yours, we need to advocate for ourselves and build the tools and build the the story and the awareness of what is actually done when it comes to farming and why this is the right thing to do and why we take a science and local-based approach. I've always believed that proximity breeds responsibility. And it's a really important thing. It's it's why it's the concept that the closer you are to something, you're probably the best in terms of being able to make a wise decision, also to be responsible to that decision. There's a political philosophy called subsidiarity. It's the same thing. Those closest in power should be the ones enabled to make the decision. Or it's why we and other companies put account managers in trucks and put them in the environment that they're going to serve in. Because you need to be accountable I think in an increasingly digital world, especially for younger generations, that's a really hard thing to get your head around because everything's now connected. Somebody can listen to this halfway across the world in real time. And when you and I were growing up, we still had stamps and mail before it became e-mail. And so we're, it's just a different world. I, I really think we have to figure out as an industry, how we use this technology to advocate to promote and to show we can make better decisions together and not have divisiveness within our own value chain because that's not productive, right? We need to be able to advocate for the things that are good for us. So what did I get right there? Or where do you feel like maybe you've got a little bit of tension? I love it. I, I think that's totally, totally a fact. I mean, one of the challenges though is it's really hard to get people to advocate for the work that they already do. And yep. with the group that I lead in climate, that's that's one of our asks of members. That's one of the things that we invite people to do. Um, we think it's going to be, and we've seen, we we know this, it's more and more necessary to take steps to share the good work that you do. Social proof, whether you or like it or not, is completely yep. essential to operate a business today. And you just have to you know, it's it's like taxes, I guess. Maybe I, I, some people like social proof; other people think it's a real nuisance. But can, if that's it, if you think it's some nuisance, then consider it like taxes. Would you not pay your taxes? You might not want to, but as a conscious citizen, you probably do. Right. You probably pay them, and you might take steps to to make that work in your favor or whatever. But you 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 take that responsibility and you do it. And I think that the social proof responsibility is of the same level today. And I think it also helps you enable yourself to operate, whether it's the the ag retail business or the farmer you serve, those who are more proactive with that. And it doesn't have to be an incredibly big lift, but just some action, some steps to be proactive are are going to have an easier road continuing to operate the way they want to than those who simply say, man, this is a pain I, I don't want to make this video. I don't want to yes. talk to my neighbors about this. I don't want to go ask them when I want to put up a new hog barn or whatever. I just want to do my dang thing. That's so, we're tempted to do it, but unfortunately or, or fortunately, it is where where we're going. And so that advocacy and and then showing you the value that you bring, telling your story, they're part of operating today. No, absolutely. I, I greatly appreciate the conversation. And before we end our podcast, and I'm sure we can do more of these, uh, Sarah Beth Aubrey, I do want to, I just, as you talked about in climate, this is a conversation. I think for people who want to learn more about you and what you're doing, first, you have inclimateconversations.com. Is that correct? That's a great place for people to find out more. Yes. Yes, it is. And if there's something that they want to do in the near term, we have our second annual Ag as the Solution Indiana Climate Summit coming up. So okay. let me take a moment to tell the audience about that. 
So this is a, a Indiana is our, our home. We're based here in Indiana, but this is really a regional multi-state event. This uh, last year was our first one. We had 200 people in attendance and we had people from 10 states there. So if you're in the Midwest in particular and you are a farmer, you are an agribusiness professional, or you are in the ag energy space, such as our co-ops and, and fuel yep. providers, things like that, perfect. Um, those are They represent the types of members we have in, in climate and the types of topics that we're going to cover. So it's the 27th of June, um, inclimateconversations.com. You can register, um, and we do have opportunities for companies that want to get in front of of these the this audience. We'd sure love to talk with you about that, or just join us, get a ticket, and, and come in and engage with peers around this very, very broad subject. We have six pillars of climate conversations that we try to cover. And so we'll be covering everything from renewables to carbon capture and storage and what leases look like when people come to your farm to talk to you about that. We'll be talking about the advanced uh, biofuels and advanced renewable fuels and what that looks like for you in the industry and what those opportunities look like for growers. We'll hear from conservation agronomists and what, what their journey is, why why they do what they do and how how they do that. Um, and, and much more, but those are a couple of our topics off the top of my head and, uh, yeah, really want to invite the audience to come. That's really, really great. And Sarah, Sarah Beth Aubrey, want to thank you again and have our listeners. We're going to put it in our show notes as well to go to, uh, give me the website again, in climate Yes. and they can learn more about the event here in 2023, uh, and how they can sponsor, participate, and interact in a variety of ways. And this is going to be held uh, on June 27th in, in Danville, Indiana. Is that correct? That's correct. So the Absolutely. Indian, if you don't know, Indianapolis metro area, a great um, convention facility, uh, plenty of parking, lots of room, and good place to meet. This is really great. I, I know that a lot of our audience is going to look into this and want to hear more. I'm sure we're going to continue these conversations. I've got a lot more questions now that we have discussions for you as a grower, but also advising retailers and crop advisors and growers out there on on how they can build better brands. And maybe I'll, I'll need some of that advice as we continue to grow our business and, and help people make better decisions. But one thing I know we both agree on is we want to move forward. We want to move the acre forward the right way, not just for this generation, but for future generations to come really in a sustainable way. So I want to thank you again for joining us in this discussion today. 